Hey guys, um, we were cleaning out freezers since we're kind of stuck at home and you know we're not leaving very much right now. Um, and we came across probably about 50 pounds of beef I forgot was in our freezer. So uh, we thawed this out and I'm gonna I'm cutting it up. Some of it will be used for steak, some of it for burger, whatnot, whatever. Uh, but I'm gonna make biltong out of a bunch of this. And so I wanted to show you guys the process for biltong because so many people have asked me. So. This is what I've cut off of this thing so far. I didn't like the looks of that. But none of this meat's gonna go to waste because what we don't use for, for us, steaks, burger, biltong, whatever, we're going to boil and feed to the dogs. So none of this meat will go to waste. So, ah, let me finish getting this one out of here. Cut that off. And yes, I'm using a, um, a uh, expat machete <laughs> to do this with because it's pretty sharp and big. So when you cut biltong, or when you're cutting for biltong, you cut a lot thicker than you ordinarily would for jerky. And then it's still frozen on the inside. Biltong, you can cut up to like three quarters of an inch, half an inch thick. Um, and we are going to process this in my dehydrator, which will speed the process up. I used to make this by air drying it, hanging it in Mel's kitchen, <laughs> which, um, she never really was a fan of, but the dog sure loved it because they would stay in there and stare up all day. Um, so let me get this out of the way so you guys can see. Yeah. So you can see what I'm doing. So as you can see, these are pretty thick slabs of meat I'm cutting, but they're going to get trimmed down. Some of this stuff to make biltong is utterly useless. So, well, I mean, I guess if I had to in a real crisis, I could, but I'm not in a crisis and I got a load of meat here. So I'm trimming these really, really well dog pile um, add this to the dog pile or the burger pile some of those probably made in a burger some of it but trimming all the fat and the sinew you know you've really got to be careful when doing biltong see like I got to separate this little piece because there's this there's a piece of sinew running through it now I can cut it off and this can still be made into biltong right here and then trim the fat see so now I have a clean piece of meat built on pile dog pile and again here I'm gonna trim all this off all the fat and I'm being a little generous with my trimming I'm leaving a little bit of meat there but you know what it doesn't matter it's gonna feed my dogs anyway and if we were to get locked down for a while um, my dogs are certainly gonna appreciate it and I'm gonna appreciate being able to feed them so here's more fat that I want to get rid of right there they're gone and that's all I'm doing. As you can see, I'm cutting this thing up. And what we'll do with this, when we start to make the biltong, we'll cut this into strips. About like this. So, these will be the strips that I make my biltong out of. About like that. The next process here, which we'll show you guys in just a little bit, will be putting the vinegar to the meat. And that has to sit at least overnight in the fridge soaking in vinegar. Um, we'll use uh, one gallon Ziploc bags for this batch because there's going to be so much meat that I don't think I have a bowl big enough to hold it all. And a five gallon bucket won't fit in my fridge, um, even though I do have a commercial <laughs> refrigerator. So that's the strips I'm cutting it into. And again, it, you know, it doesn't have any specific size. Like I can cut this small. That's two pieces of biltong right there. I'll cut this off right here. That's a piece of biltong. It doesn't all have to be super long strips. It's just chunks of meat. And the goal here is when we do the vinegar is to get vinegar on all the meat. So we'll do them individually pieces. Um, actually, probably dip them in it, kind of rub it around a little bit, drop them in a bag. That way we know we get vinegar on all of the meat. So I'm going to keep cutting this up. And when we have a pile of meat here and we're ready to do the vinegar thing, we'll come back and I'll show you guys how we do that. All right, guys, now, as you see, we got a pile of meat here. we got a pile of uh, potential burger and dog meat. We'll go through that later and kind of reclassify that. Um, but the next step is to get some vinegar on this. Now, you want to just kind of coat the meat. So what I'm doing, as you see there, I'm just sticking it in. I'm going to shake it off. And Ben's here. He's gonna, we're going to drop this in another bag. And you just need to get a little bit of the vinegar on it. You don't want to soak it in it, like let it sit in it. You just want to get the vinegar on it. And really, you can even just sprinkle vinegar on it. I like mine to have a little bit of a bite. I like that vinegar taste to it. 
so I do put a little bit more uh, vinegar to it. Like you can see, I'm actually soaking this stuff in it, but shaking it off. And then we'll take when we take this in the house, we'll take it out of the bag and we will put it in a bowl because in the fridge, that way it sort of just starts to dry a little bit. You know, as your fridge runs, it's full of moisture, humidity out of your refrigerator. And it'll do the same to the meat. So we're already gonna begin that process. And after we've done the meat um, in the vinegar solution tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we will um, take the meat out and we will do the next steps, which are um, putting the salt to it. Well, first you gotta pat it dry. Um, paper towels, pat it dry, which, you know, paper towels are a commodity right now, but tell them, trust me, it's worth it for some built-on. Uh, but you'll pat it dry, paper towels, um, so it's just kind of damp, and then you um, you start putting the salt to it, and you need a coarse salt, like kosher salt, um, rock sea salt, pink Himalayan, which is what I'll actually use, um, a little bit of cumin, and then coarse ground black pepper. Now. That is the traditional South African recipe of biltong, and that's the recipe that I use. I don't put no craziness to it, no no weird spices, no extraness. I like the traditional uh, biltong. And then, when we're done with that, and, and we'll show you again tomorrow, guys, it will go into the dehydrator. Now, I used to make this by hanging it in Mel's kitchen, um, which she wasn't a huge fan of, but now I have a really nice dehydrator. Thank you, Michael Keegans. Um, sending me a broken one and I fixed it uh, and we'll stick it in the dehydrator and what, what that allowed me to do is to do this process a hell of a lot faster which means I won't have to wait you know a week ten days two weeks to get my built on now as you notice some of these cuts this is a lot bigger than what you do for traditional jerky and you can do that with built on because it's a different process this isn't conventional jerky um, this is a this is a meat preservation method and Dried meat is the oldest way to preserve meat known to man. I mean, that's how it's been done for millennia. Um, people in the African bush still simply hang their meat, cut thin, in the trees to dry. And it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you. You do got to watch it. Um, I think that one's full, Ben. And I'm going to set this. I'm going to zip it and set it down below. You do got to watch. If you're hanging it outside, you do got to watch it. Now, the reason that the South Africans put um, the black pepper on the meat was to help keep the flies away. I guess there's something about it. Flies don't dig black pepper. And so they would put the pepper on to keep the flies out to dry their meat. So here's our next piece. This one I know is still pretty damn frozen too. Even though it's been thawing for damn days. But these are some, as you can tell, big ass cuts. And it looks like some peas got in there. <laughs> We were thawing this freezer, and this stuff was frozen in a block of ice in the bottom of the freezer, and I couldn't get it out. So, it's still pretty frozen. Let's cut it open and see here. I'm going to remove the cap just because I want to get rid of some of that that may have been exposed to water that was in the freezer. And here we go. Let's see. Temperature-wise, oh, that is still so cold. And I imagine as I go back... I'll find that it's still frozen in places. And I'm gonna cut this huge cap of fat off too, uh, just to get rid of it, because it's a pain to work with later. Makes the job a little easier in advance. So, anyway, this one's gonna get processed down the exact same way as the previous one. Um, so that when I'm done, I'll have some, uh, probably some steaks out of this one, I'm thinking, actually. It's a nice, pretty nice cut. So I'll cut some steaks out of this one and a lot of biltong. And then we will get the process complete for this, just like we did the first one. And tomorrow it will go into the dehydrator. So I'm gonna leave you guys for now and we will bring you back tomorrow when we start the next step of the process. Uh, all right, guys. So yesterday we, you saw us. We, we cut up the meat and we put it in the vinegar. You know, we did the whole thing, and it's in the fridge sitting right here. Uh, Saturday night. So now it's ready to do the next step of the operation. Now, you need to kind of pat this dry. You don't want it drippy, sopping, dripping wet. 
Um, so I'm going to cover my work surface here in butcher's paper, just uh, so I don't have shit running all over the place. Um, you know, liquid, blood, vinegar, whatever. It'll just help make this a little easier. So, now if you don't have one of these, if you pack meat, this thing is the bomb. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the video. So, let me step over here and get some meat. And so, now this was left uncovered in the fridge. I didn't cover it. And so, if you look, you can see it kind of looks like it's starting to dry there on the top. Well, I'm going to dry this meat anyway, so I don't care. So, I'm going to put some gloves on. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a little toss in the liquid that's in there real fast. And then we're going to lay it out and we're going to start drying it. And we're going to have trays to put this on. Um, so, yeah, we're going to turn this meat a little bit so that the stuff on the bottom can get to the top. Get some of that goodness on there, which is really stiff. And there goes my phone, because I didn't turn my ringer off like I should have. Um, just a quick toss. Ooh, that smells like vinegar. And now, you can control that vinegar kind of essence, depending on how much you put in there. Some people use like a spritz bottle. I, I like the heavier vinegar flavor, so I just soak it. Uh, you saw me, I dunked it in the bags, got it all good, and then put it put it away so so now and this stuff's not terribly wet it's actually in good shape and now as you can see that's a big ass hunk of meat um, you jerky makers out there are going that don't ever work bill tongs a different process so what we do is we're going to lay out the meat and strips here pieces chunks however it lays however it works out and what we have to do is start adding our seasoning and our seasoning is going to be either uh, in this case I'm using kosher salt I couldn't find the big thing of pink Himalayan and Mel's hit it from me somewhere uh, it'll be kosher salt and um, cumin and then coarse ground black pepper and that's pretty much just the basic basic recipe of biltong and I guess there's people out there that do all manner of crazy flavorings you know I bought some commercial biltong before that I was really not impressed with um, regretted buying it um, to me the, the traditional South African method of biltong is still the best obviously we're gonna have to do something about that so hold on a minute all right now that I have my damn phone turned off I still have my sunglasses on my head though you think after all these months and well years of doing this shit I would have learned by now but apparently not so anyway I'm just laying this stuff out um, by putting the you know the paper on the table it uh, absorbs some of the liquid and there's a couple pieces that are down here towards the bottom that I'll, I'll actually pat down with a uh, paper towel so just to make them a little drier because the salt when we go to put it on you want it to look like Kind of like a pretzel that you'd buy at the movie theater or 7-Eleven or where the hell ever you buy pretzels or fan, you know, you know, whatever ant, whatever the hell her name is, is pretzels. Um, you want about that much salt on them. Now again, if you like it saltier, add more salt. If you don't like it as salty, don't add as much salt. So that's a whole bowl right there. That's one whole bowl out of the way. I'm going to grab some paper towels and I'll unroll some of this, which I know these, at this moment, you guys watching this, the old virus hoarding thing is in full swing and so these are like liquid gold, you know, gold, but um, built on is worth more than that to me. So just going to dab some of these really wet ones, dry them off just a little bit. Not a lot. That's all it takes. So, and this is still essentially raw meat. However, by putting it in the vinegar last night, it's kind of already started cook the cooking process. So now, I've got me some kosher sea salt right here. 
coarse ground, which is what you want. And uh, probably end up using all this. And I may have to go find more. But so I'm going to put it in the palm of my hand. And the way I do it is I just start to sprinkle over the meat. And as you can see, it's not like tons getting on any one piece, but every piece is getting some. And then we have to turn these over and do it again. But by doing it like this on this flat surface, what's happening is all the salt that's missing the meat is just landing on the paper. And all I've got to do then is just roll this stuff onto that salt to pick it up. I don't actually have to sprinkle it again. So it'll be easier on the second pass. But you just gotta get a little bit of salt on each piece. You can oversalt this guys. Um, you know, uh, you know, over ooh, shit like that right there. There's more there than I thought I had. So I'm actually gonna knock some of that off. Um, and you know, and oversalted biltong is not uh, real pleasant. So I try to really be judicious with my salt. I mean, I want enough on there, but that's all I want is enough. And just to get a little bit on there. You know, it helps draw out the moisture in the drying process, which in this case, the dehydrator is going to do it. I used to make this. <laughs> I had wire racks that I'd made and hung from the ceiling of the kitchen in the house we lived in in South Carolina. And I would dry biltong in there, and Mel never really did kind of warm up to that whole aspect. But I still made biltong. Some things are just more important than others. And you know, and again, you know, like I was talking about, somebody asked about a biltong box. Uh, I didn't do the box because I've got a big ass Weston dehydrator. So I figure I'll use that because it's going to do better than the box. But it doesn't take much. I mean, you can hang this stuff just in your house, you know, in open air. You know, we are so conditioned these days that, you know, Ermager, that's going to kill you. That meat's going to rot. It's not going to rot. As long as it is exposed to the air, uh, and especially if you have some moving air, if you can put a little fan, a little something like that to keep the air passing over it, um, it's not going to hurt you. This is the oldest form of meat preservation known to man. This is how it was originally done way back when, you know, and it still works. So as you see, just sprinkle a little bit on, just covering it up a little bit. Now as we see, there's all kinds of salt on my paper. I'm actually going to throw some more out here on the paper. So I can roll this around to soak up some more. Now, before I do that though, I want to go ahead and put my cumin on. Now, again, this was the spice used by the, the South Africans just to add something to it. Um, I stick with that traditional recipe. And, and you know, you put what you feel is right. I go by the eyeball. As you can tell, I haven't measured a damn thing here. Um, I'm not real good about rules and shit like that. I kind of do things my own way. Sometimes they work out and sometimes they're epic failures. But this, I know works out because I've done it. We'll just sprinkle some cumin on. It ain't got to be a lot. Just, it's just a little bit of spice on the meat is all it is. So, and, and there's more getting on the paper. So I'm going to do the exact same thing when I roll this stuff over. I'm going to roll that uh, that excess cumin onto these pieces of meat. So super, super easy. I mean, this really is like the easiest thing in the world. Um, you know, I see the jerky guns and the jerky mixes and all the crazy jerky stuff you got to do. Um, and I have never found a jerky mix that I like. To me, they're all too salty. Um, they contain way too damn many chemicals. If I can't read the you know if it looks like the periodic table of elements on the back of the damn ingredients I don't, I'm not interested in that um, this is salt pepper meat cumin and uh, and that's it oh and vinegar but you know I can pronounce all those things 
you know, trimonium phosphates, you know, chlorates, hydrogenated butthole butter, whatever the hell that they add in all this stuff these days, I'm not interested in. So, just a little bit of cumin, just sprinkling, and I'll come on. Man, these holes look bigger. you think more would come out. But I like the taste of the meat. I don't want the flavorings or the herbs or the seasoning that's being used to overpower the flavor of the meat because that vinegar does something really cool to the flavor of the meat to me. Okay? Now I'm going to go ahead and scatter a little more salt around on the table just to make sure that I can roll these guys around. So now we're just going to take them and roll them in the extra salt. I can see it picking it up. It's picking up the cumin. And then for the for the the um, this, the pepper, I'll just pepper one side of it. Now, traditionally, the reason that the uh, South Africans used pepper when they made biltong, it was to keep flies away. Um, not such an issue here. My dehydrator is pretty fr fly free, so I'm not too damn worried about that. Um, not that big a deal to me. So I'll just put enough on just to add that flavor because you know a little black pepper on you know on some some good fresh meat is uh, always appreciated. The two things in my opinion that raw meat needs is salt and pepper. Salt foremost, pepper second. And this is another good reason when you're doing your you're prepping to be looking for uh, you know large quantities of salt, you know. Not just table salt, which you do need, you know, don't just store sea salt because it doesn't have the iodine in it. And if you go too long without adding some iodine to your diet, then you can start developing, you know, goiters and stuff like that, which is the whole reason they started adding it to salt back in the 30s, I want to say. Um, but if you're eating a balanced diet these days, it's really not that big a deal. So, and here we go. I'm just getting the meat coated up. I don't even need to roll it. I just need to scoot it around. But you do want to try to have it on all sides if you can. And like I said, about like a pretzel looks. Salt, salt content wise. So, and I may sprinkle some on a couple of these. So yeah. A couple of them are a little thin, so we're going to just go ahead and add a little bit directly to just a couple of these. Doesn't take much. Hmm, there we go. There we go. And now, I'm sure there's other people out there telling me, that's not how I make my bill, Tom. And that's fine. You make your biltong however the hell you make it. This is how I make my biltong. I've made it before, several times. I've eaten lots of it. It's never hurt me um, or my dogs because they love it too. All right, now, Ben, if you want to bring in a freeze dryer tray or a dehydrator tray. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to take this stuff and I'm going to lay it on a tray. This will go to the dehydrator. And like I said, you notice this stuff is considerably thicker than what you do for jerky. Um, and I'm sure there's some jerky folks out there that are just absolutely losing their damn minds right now looking at this meat. Um, but it will work. Um, and the fact that I'm using a dehydrator in particular allows me to really control the dry time, temperature, the whole thing because I don't like my biltong dried all the way out I like my biltong dried to the point that when I cut into it the meat will actually be like shiny it's like got a sheen it's like and it's still chewy on the inside but it's dry on the outside 
and that's how I prefer to have mine uh, dried. It just tastes better. Now, it doesn't store exactly like conventional biltong for the you know the same amount of time and everything. You got to take some precautions. I might refrigerate it, or I might even freeze some of it. Um, but if I was to dry this all the way out, then I could just you know store it in paper bags, and that would be fine. But since I'm probably not going to dry it all the way out, I use a little bit different storage method because it won't last terribly long. Because Ben's over there behind the camera, and Ben likes built on too. And between him and me, and Merle, who you guys saw yesterday in pictures, um, there won't be a lot of built on left, probably. I'm gonna get it. Two weeks? I think two weeks it's gonna be gone. <laughs> Cause I know I love this stuff. And let's see, a properly short piece, there we go. All right, I'll pass this tray to Ben. He's gonna give me a full one, or an empty one, I should say. And we'll keep on keeping on stacking. And then we got one more bowl to do. The process is exactly the same. Um, I'm gonna do the exact same stuff with the next bowl of biltong or of meat that I have. It's not biltong yet. I should stop calling it that. Um, and then what we'll do um, is we will bring you guys back around when we're over at the dehydrator. Now I'm gonna warn you, the dehydrator is in my shop and don't judge me. I lack the organizational gene. My shop is utter and absolute chaos at the moment. And that's just the way that is. We've been doing a lot of pretty heavy projects around here lately. And so um, everything is kind of in disarray. And one of these days we'll get in there and finish organizing the shop. But for now, it works. So here we go, laying it all out. Nice. Very nice. Oh, I can smell the cumin on it now already. With mixing with that vinegar smell. Ooh. Making me. Ooh, that making me hungry. You remember that old Cajun cup? Ooh, that. I used to like watch him on TV when I was a kid. Alright, so there we go. That's one that's one bowl. So now you guys see what the process is. Uh, I'm gonna do the next bowl. You don't need to watch me do two of them. But we'll bring it back when we go to the dehydrator and get that thing set up and we'll show you how we do that. And since I know how you guys can be on YouTube, I didn't put the pepper on the last ones. So I'm going to pepper these just so you can see that I actually do it. And we peppered the other ones, you know, afterwards. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but the reason that the South Africans put coarse ground black pepper on biltong was to keep flies away. Because their traditional method of making this was to just hang it in a damn tree. And so they put pepper on to keep flies away, which I didn't know that was a thing until I started getting into this and discovered that it was a thing. But yeah, just get a little bit of pepper on. Plus, you know, the pepper goes nicely with the salt and the uh, vinegar. It just the cumin is just such a good taste to me. You might hear a radio in the background. Comms are up today, so we're just monitoring. And it ain't gonna be tons of pepper. 
This is more of a seasoning. And there we go. Let's pepper my hands. Go turn that thing down. You can see it, right? Just, you hear my radios in the background. We got a bunch of window liquors on a DMR talk group that want a ratchet bill. I'm listening for real information, and these idiots want to talk about what kind of radio they're running. So that's the process, folks. That is it. This meat is ready to go on the dehydrating racks, which we are going to do right now. Um, and as you see, yesterday when I was processing, I wore gloves. Um, today when I'm handling, I wear gloves. Just taking precautions. You know, I could do this barehanded, of course, but um, why bother when I've got nitrile gloves? And I'll tell you, the best place I have found for nitrile gloves is Harbor Freight. Um, they make these in 12 mil plastic. And I did a brake job on Mel's car last week wearing these gloves. And they didn't rip. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty proud statement. So anyway, we're going to get these loaded on the trays. And we'll bring you guys back when we're at the dehydrator. And uh, for all the excitement that is. But uh, we'll show you the last step here in just a bit. All right, guys. So as you can see, and like I told you, don't judge me. I don't want to hear no shit about this current state of my shop. Because we've been working our asses off. Uh, we've got the meat in the dehydrator, so now it's time to um, fire it up. Now, biltong is usually air dried, so I'm not going to put this on a high heat. What I am going to do is I'm going to set it to about 85 degrees, because that's a common temperature here in Florida. And then for time, I am going to put this thing on for... Well, it only let me go 24 hours. I didn't know that. Damn it. Wait, let's do this. 23 hours. All right. So there we go. So it's going to run for 23 hours. This time tomorrow, I'll check it. Um, I'll see what it's doing. And I'll, I'll go from there. Now, it's probably going to take more than... It's going to take more than one day for this to, to, to dry. Um... Especially at this low attempt, but that's right. That's why we come out, we test it, check it out, see what it's doing. So, anyway, we will do another video when we check it. Uh, we'll do another one when it's done, of course, and then I'll give you guys a lovely shot of me and Ben enjoying some bill time at the end. But, um, but yeah, there it is. It's in the machine. Real simple. This is this is not rocket science. This is not hard. Um, air dried meat, oldest method in the world. Don't be afraid of it. Um, super simple to do.